Uh, my name is Paolo Ruffino and uh, I'm from University of York. Uh, my research so far has been mostly about gamification, uh, as I will discuss today. Um, but gamification is seen by many to be one of the latest developments of uh, the quantified self movement because it combines self tracking with elements of game design, as I will uh, discuss. Um, so what I would like to talk about today in particular is a very personal story uh, and it's a story of how I ended up my uh, two years long relationship with Nike Fuel. Um, now the reason why I talk about it as a relationship is because I've been wearing this wristband on, on my wrist uh, uh, for t more than two years every day. So I don't think any relationship could get more intimate than, than this. Um, and breaking up with it has been, of course, also a very emotional issue. Um, so I would like to talk about how I came up to the, to the decision to break up with Nike Fuel. Um, this story um, um, will, of course, be used to me to, to talk about some of the keywords of, of gamification. But first of all, what is Nike Fuel? So Nike Fuel is a technology developed by uh, Nike, the sports company. Um, it's a technology for the measurement of uh, the movement of the body. It's, uh, it has an accelerometer in, in the wristband. This is supposed to be put on the wrist uh, and to be worn at all times by the user. Uh, so the accelerometer records the movement and converts it into a Nike Fuel score, which is visible from the, from the wristband if you press the button, or by connecting the wristband to the laptop or uh, via Bluetooth to the smartphone app. Uh, at midnight, the score resets and the counting starts again from zero. It is designed for sport practitioners as well as beginners. It is advertised as a tool for self-improvement by self-tracking. And it is very often used on, as a reference on uh, texts about gamification and on the quantified self-movement. Gary Wolf, actually, from the from Wired Magazine uses Nike Fuel as an example quite often. Um, so, uh, the reason why I would like to reconstruct this romantic relationship that I had with Nike Fuel is to, in order to, is, I will use this story to rethink some of the keywords that are very often used to discuss about gamification and also about the quantified self movement. And these keywords are engagement, first of all, uh, but also movement, time, uh, space and also maybe life, uh, we, as, as if there will be time, we will talk a bit about the meaning of life in this presentation. Um, and I would also like to discuss about my own personal experience with Nike Fuel as a, as a strategy to, to, to counter some of the dominant narratives on gamification and the quantified self-movement they try to analyze and quantify the metrics of these tools uh, on, on, their, on, uh, uh, on their users. So they essentially try to, to focus on the, on the statistics about users' acquisition and, and retention, seen as methods for telling the truth about the effects of gamification and quantified self-technologies. So instead, what I would like to argue is that uh, we can develop multiple counter-narratives by looking at how individuals engage with um, uh, gamification and quantified self-technologies. Um, but first, what is gamification? So in, uh, in a few words, as defined by Deterding et al. quite uh, effectively, is the use of game design elements in non-game context. So gamification is a current trend in the design of apps and services for uh, self-improvement. Uh, oriented to education, learning, uh, health, um, and so on. And it is used very often to attract new customers uh, in um, online and digital businesses. Extensive use of the term is reported since, since 2010, 2011, although the term gamification has been used also in, at the beginning of 2000. Um, it is, discourses about gamification are quite dominated by the marketing consultancy sector. And when Deterding et al. defined in 2011 gamification as the use of uh, game design elements in non-game context, what they meant uh, was that with game design elements uh, is, uh, well, what they broadly define as elements that are characteristic to games. And more specifically, uh, uh, these are usually interface and game design uh, patterns, such as uh, badges, uh, levels, scores, rankings, leaderboards, 
uh, rewards and so on. So for example, with Nike Fuel, uh, what you get once you upload your data uh, on, on your, uh, your personal service, uh, your personal profile, is a series of uh, statistics about your own activity and you can compare them with, uh, with your own uh, performance from previous days and you can compare it in the future with uh, how you will move in the, in, the, in the following days and you get a series of badges and scores to kind of reward yourself if you have been moving um, um, if you have been moving throughout the day. Uh, so it reminds a game-like experience. Okay. Um, in the last few years, we have seen uh, the emergence of many events uh, and publications and conferences about gamification. Uh, the website gamification.co, CO, uh, owned and managed by Gabe Ziegerman, who is one of the gurus of gamification. Uh, it's a website that updates on daily news and case stories about gamification. If you want to spend time on, on the website, you will see that uh, every day has very, uh, has very different stories. So gamification is, is seen as a very broad um, uh, phenomenon that can include uh, stories about health, education, and uh, also for the improvement of um, uh, uh, the conditions of, of, of labor and, and work, for example. Uh, but also and mostly brand loyalty and consumer retention. Most of the stories reported on gamification.co are about uh, how businesses have been improving their consumer retention by uh, using gamification. There is also an annual conference called Gamification Summit organized by Gabe Ziegerman again um, every year in San Francisco since 2011. There are also, of course, many publications. Um, the book uh, Gamification by Design, Implementing Game Mechanics in Web and Mobile Apps, the one at your left, is uh, authored by Gabe Ziegerman and Christopher Cunningham, is probably the most popular book. And in textbooks on gamification, such as uh, Gamification by Design, um, gamification is mostly presented as a technique, uh, as a technique based on the collection and analysis of previous experiences in user engagement. So gamification is there presented as a series of very practical and operational suggestions on how to involve uh, the users, be they uh, customers, citizens, employee, employees, or gamers, and how to maximize their performance through uh, this ga the, the creation of this game-like scenario. So in order to achieve this goal, game, gamified technologies uh, need to collect and archive data about the user. And data needs to be first archived and processed to later become part of the game. Uh, and it is a collect collected according to a principle of transparency, as you can see if you read this, these textbooks. Um, gamification uh, proposes itself as a technique to play with the truths, with the facts about, about the user and attempts to assist the user in improving those true facts, those, those real data about the self. So here you can see how the, the connection is, can easily be made with the quantified self movement, which very similarly uh, proposes to quantify the self in order to, to improve it. Um, and the quantified self movement has in fact originated in a context which is very similar to gamification. Uh, it is mostly the TED Talk series, uh, both terms and expressions have been made popular around 2010-2011 uh, when uh, mostly through the pages of Wired magazine both gamification and the quantified self-movement receive extensive uh, exposure. So collection and data processing is oriented towards the improvement of life. Uh, here is in, life is intended as the sum of the data about a person's body, as it is generated during daily activities. Uh, the quantified self is also promoted as a solution to medical pro problems and for the improvement of certain uh, char characteristics of the body. So gamification can actually be seen as a further step in the process of quantifying the self in which the improvement of life happens through a game-like environment and towards the establishment of practices of participation between users. Now, one of the keywords of the discourses about gamification is engagement. So engagement is seen by many authors who work on gamification as the sort of the holy grail of gamification. It's the, the most important concept. Once you are uh, capable of uh, designing an effective and engaging experience, you are 
uh, a master of gamification. Um, so engagement is uh, used to, as a term to discuss and, and, and represent the extent to which players are using the game and being influenced by, by the game. Zickerman and, and Cunningham in Gamification by Design actually start their text with a definition of engagement. Uh, and this is how they define it. Um, the term engagement in a business sense, they say, uh, indicates the connection between a consumer and a product ser or, or service. Unsurprisingly, the term is also used to name the period in a romantic couple's relationship during which they are preparing and planning to spend the rest of their lives together. Engagement is the period of time at which we have a great deal of connection with a person, place, thing, or idea. Somehow this uh, definition is seen as being too broad and too problematic by the two authors, so they quite quickly narrow it down <clears throat> in something much more prosaic, uh, and they say that engagement maybe is better if you quantify it through an E-score or engagement score, which includes uh, recency, frequency, duration, virality, rating, etc. I will not go into the details of this, mostly because actually I quite like the broad definition that they first define and that they so quickly dismiss. Uh, so engagement, uh, if we take it in its more kind of romantic uh, interpretation, um, so what is it? It's a special kind of relationship. Uh, and it's a relationship that precedes a passage towards a more binding relationship. Uh, so engagement is, by definition, um, expected to end at one point and transform into something else. En engagement is a term which actually does not simply define a relationship, but a relationship between two things that are about to change their relationship. So it, is, it implies change. It implies movement towards uh, a point of mod modification of the relationship itself. It implies progress towards an event that will alter the terms of, of the engagement itself. Engagement implies change and movement. Now, what's interesting is that uh, Nike Fuel, these uh, gadget is in fact sold as and advertised as a technology for the quantification of movement and movement is uh, the keyword used by Nike to advertise its own product uh, and I think it's not just a coincidence so what I would like to show you now uh, is the ad used by Nike to present its product uh, I would like you to focus on the the words that are actually used by the voiceover to describe Nike fuel The audio doesn't work now. It was working before. Well, it is a presentation about technological failures anyway, so it's perfectly, um, it fits perfectly with what I'm about to say. Experience all tell our I'll probably actually lower it down. It's, it's quite yeah. loud now. Mm -hmm. 
Our minds, our bodies, and our experience all tell us that movement is life, and that the more we move, the more we live. It's something athletes have understood from the beginning. The kind of movement it takes to improve your game is the kind of movement it takes to improve your life. But unlike sport, life doesn't come with convenient ways of measuring movement. So we developed one, Nike Fuel, a single universal unit uniquely designed to measure the movement of the entire human body for the entire human race. Whatever your weight, whatever your gender, whatever your activity. It's that simple and that revolutionary. So get out there, find what fuels you, and get moving. Um, okay, uh, sorry for the, for the interruption. Um, so, movement is life is the slogan by, by Nike. And this is the text of the voiceover, right? So, what I would like to, to focus on is the first part of it, where the, the voiceover says, our minds, our bodies, and our experience all tell us that movement is life, and that the more we move, the more we live. Now, um, the video shows people of different ages, different races, practicing sports at more or less professional levels. They all move and therefore they all live according to the syllogism implicated by the presentation given in the spot. So the slogan, movement is life, is quite key to understand Nike fuel. But how is Nike really understanding movement and life? Uh, so what I would like to argue in this presentation is that uh, Nike's understanding of movement is actually rather homogeneous, uh, static, and spatialized. So what Nike is ultimately uh, promoting is a kind of movement that remains static. Uh, now, in order to argue and to, to, uh, the, about, about this, I would like to confront Nike's slogan, Movement is Life, with the very same uh, slogan uh, pronounced by by uh, someone else, by Henri Bergson, who similarly concluded that movement is life, but much earlier, and with very different uh, conclusions, we coming from very different premises. Um, so Henri Bergson, in uh, Time and Free Will, uh, actually explains uh, his idea of movement and life. Now, I will not go into the, to the details of, of his uh, explanation, but I will only stop on, on one uh, argument, uh, uh, unfortunately, we need to, to show another video now. So hopefully it's going to be much smoother. So what I would like to, to show you is um, a video by the Open University where they explain uh, the paradox of Zeno, uh, in particular the story of Achilles uh, and the tortoise. Um, now, this paradox, uh, formulated by the Greek philosopher, it's been uh, uh, received a confutation or, a, or an explanation by Henri Bergson much later on. And through the, his explanation of this paradox, I would like to, uh, to introduce Bergson's understanding of movement. Sixty Second Adventures in Thought. Number one. Achilles and the tortoise. How could a humble tortoise beat the legendary Greek hero Achilles in a race? The Greek philosopher Zeno liked the challenge and came up with this paradox. First, the tortoise is given a slight head start. Anyone fancying a flutter would still rush to put their money on Achilles. But Zeno pointed out that to overtake him, Achilles would first have to cover the distance to the point where the tortoise began. In that time, the tortoise would have moved, so Achilles would have to cover that distance, giving the tortoise time to amble forwards a bit more. Logically, this would carry on forever. However small the gap between them, the tortoise would still be able to move forward while Achilles was catching up, meaning that Achilles could never overtake. 
taken to an extreme, this bizarre paradox suggests that all movement is impossible. But it did lead to the realization that something finite can be divided an infinite number of times. This concept of an infinite series is used in finance to work out mortgage payments, which is why they take an infinite amount of time to pay off. So, um, what was Bergson's response to the, Zeno, uh, to the paradox of Zeno? Uh, well, it was that, of course, Achilles actually will uh, reach and pass the tortoise um, because it's, it's much faster. But the paradox of Zeno remains unsolvable as long as uh, movement is seen as homogeneous and spatialized, as, as Bergson puts it. So in this quote, uh, Bergson explains the problem quite well. So why does Achilles, Achilles outstrip the tortoise? Because each of Achilles' steps and each of the tortoise steps are indivisible acts insofar as they are movements and are different magnitudes insofar as they are space. This is what Zeno leaves out of the account when he reconstructs the movement of Achilles, forgetting that space alone can be divided and put together again in any way we like, and thus confusing space with motion. So according to Bergson, the movements of Achilles and the tortoise are different in kind. While space can differ by degree, by magnitude, it can be more or less. So according to Bergson, movement has its own duration, and duration cannot be reduced to space. The space surrounding Achilles and the tortoise is in fact homogeneous and can be uh, divided an infinitely number of time in infinitely smaller fragments, but the movements of Achilles and the tortoise are not similarly homogeneous and happen in time as much as in space. So Bergson solves his paradox, uh, the paradox of, of Zeno, uh, by um, introducing what he names intuition, right? So, uh, and what uh, this is what Deleuze later on will define as uh, stating a problem and solving it in terms of time rather than of space. The sports company Nike instead actually reinforces the paradox uh, by Zeno by specializing movement and life with it. Bergson will say that Nike actually uses an intellectual uh, approach rather than in, an intuitive approach. So when intellect is analytical in that it divides and recomposes things uh, in order to give us the knowledge that we need to satisfy our needs, Intuition gives us instead the knowledge of how things are in constant movement and always in the process of becoming other. So this is why ultimately I believe that Nike's conception of movement and of life actually remains static. And Nike actually says this explicitly in its advertisement, if you remember. They say, Nike Fuel is supposed to measure the movement of the entire human body for the entire human race, whatever your weight, whatever your gender, whatever your activity. So they're essentially saying that there are no movements that can be different in kind or quality. They cannot be homogeneously uh, quantified by the wristband. But then how can anyone really be engaged and happily engaged with something that doesn't move, something that is so static? So how can engagement make anyone happy if there are no differences in kind between the various movements that the couple goes through together? Now, during my relationship with Nike Fuel, there's been a time actually when that it should have triggered my, my attention. It did only much later on. Um, after about nine months of our relationship, um, an event happened that actually changed, uh, could have changed my uh, relationship with it. It didn't raise any particular concern at the time, but it gave me later a good reason to rethink the value of our engagement. So after about nine months for the date of purchase, I had a technical, the, the wristband had a technical fault. Uh, it was not working prob properly. Essentially, it was uh, altering the data whenever I was traveling to a different time zone. Uh, so I wrote to Nike's account on Twitter, as you can see. That's from December 2014, uh, trying to report the problem. This went on for a few weeks, and ultimately, I was offered to replace my uh, wristband. I was given a new one. 
Now, uh, the problem was that the Nike Fuel uh, wristband that I got as a replacement was working exactly like the previous one, but of course without the technical fault. So everything was fine, it seemed. Um, but actually, much later on, I started questioning what really happened there. So what was I really engaging with if the wristband had been replaced? Was I engaging with Nike Fuel as a concept, abstract concept, or was I actually engaging with something else? Did the terms of our engagement change somehow, or should they have, ch should they have changed? And will Nike Fuel as a wristband work exactly in the same way if it moved to, to someone else? And of course, of course it, it did. It doesn't quantify my own movement, but anyone's movement. Um, which, of course, might sound like an, an obvious statement, but in fact, actually, it triggered a, a, a consideration in me. Um, because, you know, relationships sometimes come to an end when there is an unexpected event that changes the terms of the relationship. So let's say, for example, someone cheats or someone needs to move to a different town, uh, changing job, whatever. And these events are seen as a rupture in an established order, which makes the previous condition of the relationship impossible to recover. Events of this kind cannot be undone. So in those circumstances, it is usually <clears throat> said that nothing can be the same ever again. Between us, nothing can be the same ever again. In my case, actually, I slowly started to realize that by swapping the wristband with a new one, everything will have always stayed the same, same forever, which is much worse. So after these considerations, I came to the conclusion that Nike Fuel and I could actually replace each other with no significant consequences. So, in other words, the daily scores that I accumulated for over two years, while being different from each other by their degree or intensity, by being different in magnitude, being higher or uh, lower scores, were unlikely to ever become of, of a different kind, of a different quality a quality that will be incomparable and indivisible by the same criteria applied to all the other previous uh, measurements that are also going to be applied to all my future movements. So the game of gamification, as we know, never really ends. We know that tomorrow the game will be repeated according to the same criteria, according to the same mechanics. Um, our engagement will always be measured and evaluated through the same criteria of the present. So if this was really a romantic relationship, a romantic engagement, it could be said that Nike Fuel is a wristband that never becomes a ring. It never becomes something different. Okay, so what are my conclusions after this experience with Nike Fuel? So by telling this personal story, I've been trying to reflect on some of the most common use keywords of gamification and quantify itself. First of all, engagement, but also movement, time, and life to a certain extent. Uh, uh, we've also seen how these are uh, discussed by Nike and it's in the presentation of its Nike Fuel product. And also as they appear in the literature on uh, uh, gamification and the quantify itself movement. I have approached this through a personal story, uh, one that looks at my own engagement with Nike Fuel, uh, and also the failure of the promise of movement as it was advertised by Nike, and particularly at the static conception of time and life that the technology ultimately offers. So within these conditions, uh, our relationship could only come to an end. Uh, our relationship that was supposed to be, since the beginning, all about movement, was not really going anywhere. Uh, so in conclusion, I think we can maybe start thinking about uh, other keywords, uh, not necessarily to replace engagement, but to, to uh, maybe uh, further kind of define what we are really doing when we engage with uh, our quantified selves. I don't think that engagement really works ultimately because uh, it promises change, a change that never really happens, uh, a mu mutual change that is supposed to happen at one point in time. So this implied promise of movement and mutual change is necessarily going to fail and disappoint. Uh, engagement implies its own end, its own transformation in a relationship of a different kind. But as it is currently understood in texts about on gamification, 
Engagement is instead only, uh, can only change by magnitude, by quantity. As you might remember uh, uh, when I first introduced the definition of engagement by Zigerman and Cunningham, uh, they evaluate it to a metric, to a score. So it can get higher or lower, but it's never going to change in kind. So rather than engagement, maybe we can start thinking about gamification and quantified selves as things that we to live with uh, more broadly, as temporary companions. Uh, we can think of our relationship with our quantified selves, maybe in terms of kinship, uh, which is, I think, a much slightly more preferable, as it is open to uncertainty, it is open to, to change, it is open to the possibility that relations might also come to an end. Um, it is all open to the possibility of unpredictable events actually happening in the relationship with, with the other. Uh, it also looks at the ev events of the relationship, uh, rather than looking at engagement as homogeneous, as an homogeneous condition uh, to be analyzed through metrics and statistics. It opens, uh, therefore, to an intuitive understanding of gamification and quantified self, one that considers the problems in terms of time rather than space, as in a, in a constant process of becoming a movement rather than as something static. Accidentally, this might also be a suggestion for developers and designers. Uh, what would be a gamification or a quantified self-experience, which actually opens to and welcomes uncertain events, which is expected to change in time, which might change in time, and that changes the terms of the engagement radically in a way that cannot be undone. Uh, what could be this other kind of gamification and quantified self? Uh, it will definitely require from the side of the user a different kind of engagement, a different kind of interaction, interactions that are uh, personal, intuitive, timely, and unique, that cannot be repeated. So I'm not sure how this engagement with these quantified selves will be like exactly, but I'm sure it will be different, it will be much more interesting, and certainly much more fun to play with. Thank you.